Welcome to this tutorial 1.3, the third in a series of tutorials aimed at uh, the novice um, to preoptive cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And you'll hopefully remember that in tutorial 1.2, uh, we progressed to talk about the anaerobic threshold. Um, and this tutorial 1.3 um, adds on to uh, that tutorial. So I'm just going to tidy up the uh, desktop a bit and remove the title of this tutorial so we've got a bit more space. And you can see that I've already plotted out uh, on the screen a sequence of dots and this is a recap of the end of the previous tutorial 1.2. And these dots represent sequential measures of oxygen so this is oxygen consumption <clears throat> and we'll just put um, a couple of values on and I'm going to try and draw the vertical axes to the same scale and the vertical axis is carbon dioxide output and hopefully you'll recall from tutorial 1.2 that there are two general methods for identifying the anaerobic threshold from this graph. So what's happening on this graph is during the cardiopulmonary exercise test from rest gradually the patient uh, generates more power against uh, an incremental workload that increases incrementally obviously and whilst the oxygen goes up, whilst consumption goes up so the carbon dioxide output goes up but the carbon dioxide output under aerobic conditions goes up less than the oxygen consumption goes up. So the ratio of movement upwards is approximately 80% of the uh, movement of the dots to the right during aerobic conditions. After uh, we've reach the anaerobic threshold and progress beyond it, the increase in um, carbon dioxide exceeds the increase in oxygen consumption. So the two methods uh, utilize this characteristic. The first method called the V-slope method we um, was the initially described method and plotted two regression lines through points before and points after the anaerobic threshold and where those points intersected one drew down to the horizontal axis and stated the anaerobic threshold in terms of mils of oxygen per minute or perhaps normalized to mass moles of oxygen per kilogram per minute. Okay now the current method the default method is to draw a unitary tangent so just have a solid black um, blue line here the angle of which is 45 degrees and we pull with our mouse on the screen with your software we pull that unitary tangent in until it's touching the dots and having failed to make it touch I'll just make the dots a bit bigger um, and the last dot to be in contact with that uh, cursor, if there's more than one dot, we'll call that the anaerobic threshold. Okay, so hopefully that's a recap of where we got to. Now, before we progress to supplementary, <clears throat> supplementary graphs to help you identify the anaerobic threshold, there's one particular part of what I've just said that I'd like to emphasize again. And this relates to confusion between one ratio of 1.0 and another ratio of 1.0. So hopefully you'll remember that the what you're seeing during the test is various measurements on vertical axes. And usually against time, this is what you see in real time. We've got a period at rest a period of about three minutes free wheel or exactly three minutes free wheel and then approximately 10 minutes of pedaling during which oxygen consumption 
goes up at the beginning of free will, approximately doubles, although more than that with fat legs. Then a slight delay after the onset of um, external power, which is starting here, which goes up linearly at a rate that you set as a clinician. And that's followed and paralleled under normal circumstances by an increase in oxygen consumption, as long as the axes are plotted to appropriate scales, which I won't recap on. Okay. And during that time, the cum dot side, aerobic conditions, the, ox the cum dot side's less, output's less than the oxygen consumption. And then there's a change in that relationship. And then the two points cross. Now, there is a crossover point here where the blue line, or cum dot side output, um, matches the red line, the oxygen consumption. That is not the anaerobic threshold. The anaerobic threshold has happened before then. Okay. So the anaerobic threshold always occurs when this ratio is less than one. So this ratio is the respiratory exchange ratio which is the carbon dioxide divided by carbon dioxide output divided by the oxygen consumption. So that's the re respiratory exchange ratio. And on this graph that we've just used for the anaerobic threshold, we can um, draw a ratio of one, which is where this point crosses. We can draw a ratio of one all the way along. So intersection of 1,000 to 1,000, that's a dot. Intersection of zero and zero, that's a dot. Intersection of uh, 2,000 and 2,000, although I probably haven't drawn this straight line. Okay, so wobbly hand. This is a ratio of 1.0. Okay, so this is a respiratory exchange ratio equals 1.0. And remember the dots... So let's just plot that first dot at rest, maybe 200 mils oxygen, or 250 mils oxygen consumption, let's call it 250. And the carbon dioxide output is less, about 80%, so we'll call it um, 200. And we plot the intersection of those two values, and I'm going to use my turquoise again. Okay, and then the uh, next point we'll plot is say um, oxygen at 500 come dioxide has gone up to 400 and another blue dot okay and I hope this looks similar to what I drew before now you'll see all these dots are below the spiritual exchange ratio of 1.0 and you'll remember that we're using the um, modified v select method to bring in a unitary tangent which is the same angle as the black line here so we're going to hopefully this looks parallel to the black line we're going to bring it in from the bottom right hand corner like you're trying to palpate uh, hepatomegaly and we are going to bring that blue line to touch the plotted data points. And we're going to mark that as the anaerobic threshold. Now, do you remember that what I said was the change, the change delta change in carbon dioxide output at um, above the anaerobic threshold is greater than the change in carbon in oxygen consumption. So the slope of these blue dots becomes greater than one. However, the ratio, the absolute value of carbon dioxide consumption to, so output to oxygen consumption remains at least for quite a while below an RER of one. So the anaerobic threshold occurs before you reach the RER of 1. It occurs before those two lines cross over on the real-time plot. And they occur when the 
change in carbon dioxide exceeds the change in oxygen consumption. So when these turquoise dots, their slope is steeper than one. Okay, I hope that clarifies something that took me three years to work out the difference between this ratio here, whoops, here of one of of one and this ratio here of one, they're not the same ratio. So you need to try and uh, clarify that in your head. The anaerobic threshold always happens at an RER less than one. Okay, so what other plots can we use, excuse me, to uh, help us identify the anaerobic threshold? Well, we can use, I'm going to introduce here something called ventilatory equivalents. And I'm going to draw them as you can, you can plot them out real time during a, a, a color permanent exercise test. So we'll use time initially on the horizontal axis. Okay. We're going to change horizontal axis later, but we'll use time to begin with. <clears throat> and vertically, we're going to plot these things called ventilatory equivalents. Ventilatory equivalents. Remember the, the ending's TS, not CE. So it's not equivalents, it's equivalents. And you have those for um, both oxygen in red and uh, carbon dioxide output in blue. And they are the equivalence or ratio is of minute ventilation divided by, for oxygen, it would be oxygen output and for carbon dioxide it would be minute ventilation divided by carbon dioxide output okay so what does that mean what does what does that mean what does that mean well if you listen to my um, deep breathing um, I'll hopefully give you an indication of their value so remember we're looking at how hard I'm breathing to achieve exchange of oxygen and to achieve the exchange of carbon dioxide. Now, which of the following five second sequences would be a patient you'd be more concerned about? Okay, sequence one follows now. Sequence two follows now. <sighs> So uh, the second person, let's say they both are achieving the same amount of oxygen uh, consumption and the same amount of carbon dioxide outputs. The first patient breathing quietly has a low minute ventilation. The second patient breathing heavily has a high minute ventilation. So what that tells us, <coughs> excuse me, if we plot these values on the vertical axis, a high value is bad because I'm having to breathe hard to achieve gas exchange and a low value is good okay and the values change in a characteristic pattern during a cardioprimine exercise test so I'm going to use red to represent this the ventilate equivalent for oxygen it's going to start as time progresses, it comes down and then it goes up. Okay, so before I draw on cum dot side, let's just try and understand that what this means is that during a single test in the same patient, their gas exchange improves because these dots go down. So why does gas exchange improve during an exercise test? Well, you need to think about what is happening to their breathing. <clears throat> Minute ventilation is going up. However, to begin with, your frequency stays pretty much the same. What changes is your tidal volume goes up. As your tidal volume goes up, the dead space 
or the proportion of the total breadth, that's dead space, the proportion goes down. Although the absolute amount of dead space goes up a bit with a bigger breadth, the proportion that's uh, dead space goes down. <coughs> so a greater proportion of your breath uh, is involved in gas exchange and therefore you achieve um, oxygen uh, consumption at a relatively lower um, a relatively lower ratio of minute ventilation to oxygen consumption. And the carbon dioxide ventilatory equivalent shows a similar pattern. Uh, although I've drawn it um, below, uh, it actually would usually be above. So um, let's just scrub that. And let's put in um, carbon dioxide. Because your cardiac output, your, I beg your pardon, your carbon dioxide output is less during aerobic conditions than your oxygen consumption, you're still breathing the same amount. For, you've not set, you don't have two mouths, one for oxygen, one for carbon dioxide. Therefore, your ventilated equivalent must be higher, less efficient for carbon dioxide. Anyhow, that's not a point I wish to belabor. So what you'll notice is they both improve, gas exchange improves uh, for both in a similar pattern and they both have a nadir. But the nadir for oxygen happens before the nadir for carbon dioxide. And is the nadir the lowest value for the ventilator equivalent for oxygen that is usually coincident with the anaerobic threshold. Above the anaerobic threshold, <clears throat> your minute ventilation is, at least for a time, still um, gauged to output carbon dioxide in order to keep steady uh, arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. <clears throat> However, um, above the anaerobic anaerobic threshold, a chunk of that carbon dioxide isn't anything to do with oxygen. It's no longer linked hand in hand in the mitochondria. The, you've got additional carbon dioxide from the cytoplasm, which is driving ventil ventilation a bit more, which means that as far as oxygen is concerned, you're actually breathing more than you need to. And therefore, the ventilator equipment go back up again. So your, gas, your efficiency of gas exchange deteriorates for oxygen. <coughs> So let us, I'm coming to the end now, as uh, I don't want to make this one too long, and we'll, we, we'll have anaerobic threshold part three in uh, tutorial 1.4 next. So let us just have two graphs, and we are going to use for the horizontal axes in both graphs, oxygen consumption, okay? And it's going to be to the same scale. The upper graph is going to be <clears throat> the graph we use for modified V slope. So let's pop some turquoise dots on. Da, 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 da. Sometimes, guys, I forget you're there and I'm talking to myself. And we bring in a unitary tangent. And we'll drop a vertical down to the horizontal axis and there is our anaerobic threshold. <clears throat> On the lower axis, we are going to plot the ventilator equivalent for oxygen. I've got my dot over the V for, for a minute ventilation. <clears throat> and remember the dots go down. They're reaching nadir. And then they come up. And if we plot where that nadir is, 
it should be coincident with the kick up where the upper graph, the um, gradient of these blue dots exceeds one. And here we have a nadir in maintained equivalence reduction. So these two graphs together, often you have noise in one or other graph, noise there, difficult to tell where the error threshold is. So then what you do is you go to this second graph, you look at this, you look at that, and it might give clarity <coughs> to uh, determining your anaerobic threshold. Um, there is a third graph, and I'll mention that at the beginning of tutorial 1.4. So thanks for watching. This was tutorial, Cardiopoint Exercise Testing Tutorial 1.3.